This has been a recording of a live webinar presentation. For brevity, we have cut out the live question and answer portion that followed the end of the webinar. We're happy to answer any questions you have via phone or email. You're always welcome to email the Equine Welfare Data Collective at ewdc at horsecouncil.org. Thank you again for listening. Our goal for this webinar today is that it's going to be kind of an educational opportunity for folks to learn more about us, what we do, a little bit of our history, our goals, and part of our method methodology of how we collect the data, what we do with the data, et cetera. And then we also will have a Q&A, an open Q&A at the end. And as you had hopefully seen in the email I sent out, for the Q&A at the end, we will take questions via the group chat, which our UHC, the United Horse Council Program Director, Ashley Harkins, is helping to moderate today. And then we also have the hand raise opportunity. So if you all just take a second and identify in the group chat, sometimes you have to click on the participants, see the participants, and you'll see there's a raise hand option. So just make sure you know where that is when we get to the Q&A at the end. A little bit about myself. My name is Emily Stearns. I'm the program manager for the Equine Welfare Data Collective. I've been working with horses my entire life. I kind of self-identify as one of those crazy horse girls. I own an off-the-track thoroughbred and a rescue, a free rescue pony, who there's always that time in your life where you end up with a free pony that you don't quite know how it got there. And I really have spent a lot of time Sorry, I got to notice that I'm getting a little soft. Hopefully this is better for you guys. I really have spent a lot of time doing research in the welfare industry and I've worked in rescues on the adoption agent side and the adoption counseling side and with livestock and dogs and cats. And I've also done a lot of work in the horse world in general, managing farms and training and riding. So I like to think I have a wide range of skills that kind of sets me up to help this program to be the best it can. So for our agenda today, we will talk about the history of the Equine Welfare Data Collective, how we came to be and our goals. We will talk about an explanation of our methodology, how we collect the data, what we're doing with it, and what you can do with it. We'll have some examples of the data we have collected. And then we'll have our open Q&A. This is just a reminder that if you are calling in on a cell phone, that you'll want to make sure you have muted your microphone on your cell phone. And if you're calling in from a computer that you mute your speakers or not your speakers, your microphone on your computer. And literally any little background noise tends to get picked up. So make sure you're all muted. So we'll start with the EWDC history, who we are, how we came to be, and our goals. So we are the Equine Welfare Data Collective, and we are a program housed within the United Horse Coalition. And the United Horse Coalition is overseen by the American Horse Council. We are grant funded by the AAEP Foundation, the ASPCA, and the Right Horse Initiative. So our program's funding comes from several different locations, but we are directly overseen by the United Horse Coalition and by the American Horse Council. The big question is how did we get here? So we evolved from multiple discussions among various organizations, not just our grant funders, but pretty much any organization involved with grant funding and certifying rescues and sanctuaries all at one point or another within the community has had this general understanding that there's a lack of data happening within our community and a lack of understanding about the specific numbers of how many horses are going through rescues, how many adoptions there are, where they're going, things like that, and how many at-risk horses need help. So the idea has been talked about really as early as kind of the mid 2000s. And all these people eventually came together and decided that something needed to be done and the data needed to be collected. The dog and cat world essentially has kind of a 10 year head start 
on us in terms of data collection. So it really is time for us to be thinking about how to collect this data and what we can do with this data. And just for an example, in the dog and cat world, having this kind of data has helped to increase live release rates, increase adoption rates, all kind of positive things and positive change we want to see within the equine welfare community as well. The current data we have, so the main issue is that the current data we have, there's this general understanding that it's anecdotal and that all of these organizations that rely on data have done what we can with the data we have. And these are direct quotes from people within the ASPCA, people within the American Horse Council, people within the AAEP, pretty much any organization that helps horses in any aspect understands that we won't be able to do much more unless we have a better understanding of how many horses need help. Our goal, so the creation of our program, our goal is to assess the current at-risk equine population. So that means collect these statistics, how many are at risk, where are they coming from, how are they leaving uh, rescues and sanctuaries, any sort of municipal organization, where are they going, and track the trends within those statistics. So are adoptions increasing? Are more horses coming in from law enforcement seizures? We really want to collect and distribute as accurate as data as possible to help drive positive change within the community. And so that means collect this data and allow not just you all, but the general public to see the numbers and see what we can do and organize to create the most positive impact within the community. We consider ourselves a true collaboration of various viewpoints and our ultimate goal is to help as many at-risk equines as possible. And we pride ourselves on transparency and all aspects of the program, including our funding, our intent with the data and our methodology. We try to answer any questions we can. So keep that in mind throughout the presentation today. Whatever questions you think of at the end, we will do our best to answer. So for the methodology, we have several things to discuss today. We have how we target our samples and how we target who answers our survey, what we do with the answers in the survey, and what we do with the reports that we create from the data sets created by the survey. So the first thing to talk about would be our population. And what we've done is we've created a database of essentially all the available rescues, municipal organizations, sanctuaries. We have scoured the internet top to bottom, state to state for every state in the country, including Alaska and Hawaii, that take custody of equines. And we have created a list and we go through that list and we are contacting essentially every single one to confirm one that they're still active because there are plenty of groups listed who maybe are no longer active for one reason or another. So first we try to confirm that they're active. And second, we try to confirm that they take custody of equines. So we're targeting currently 501c3 organizations and municipal organizations. So our goal is to collect information specifically from these organizations. And what we've done now that we have our target population is we created a survey and the survey is currently hosted on SurveyMonkey and it has questions that ask about the current equine population. So we have some questions about breeds. We have some questions about intakes and outcomes. So are animals coming from law enforcement seizures, owner surrenders, lost horses, found horses, stray horses, born in the shelter, that kind of thing, and what the outcomes are. So are they adopted? Are they being returned to the owner? Um, euthanasia, died in care, and other outcomes. Really um, average, normal questions that we track throughout the welfare industry with any animal that we're talking about. And then we have the organization statistics. So we're asking organizations to talk about their own capacity, how many horses they think they could be taken care of, what the limitations to that capacity are, um, 
what kind of record keeping they're using, if they're using paper records, uh, if they're using software like shelter software or barn manager software. And we really want to try to frame a picture of how the community is operating and see if there's things we can do to be helping them. And just a reminder to please mute your microphone as you come in. So we look at this survey, the survey we have hosted on SurveyMonkey, and we've created an annotated survey guide. So if you want to see any of the questions, you can go to our website, and the annotated survey guide is posted publicly there for you to see. So you can look at the questions at any point in time, ahead of time, before you answer the survey, or if you just want to see what we're asking, it's there for you all to check out. We look at the survey we've made, and we evaluate it biannually. So twice a year, and currently that's in about February and November, twice a year we go through the questions and we see are there questions that statistically are bad questions, so are they difficult to answer, are the answers really all over the place because it's worded poorly or something like that, and we also ask ourselves if there's any questions we can rotate out because if there's other data points we want to be able to collect, we want to make sure the survey doesn't get too long and cumbersome. And that evaluation happens biannually. We had talked about reaching out to rescues monthly or quarterly in terms of asking them to submit data. But that feedback from our pilot study was that quarterly and monthly were going to be too cumbersome. Um, that time, as always, is the most precious resource that, survey, that um, rescues and municipal orgs and sanctuaries have, especially when we're talking about working with horses. So biannually it made it that the actual sitting down and doing calculations of numbers dividing it up into two chunks a year was going to be easier than just big one big chunk and in terms of tracking trends two chunks a year breaks it down a little bit for us as well on the statistical analysis side so now that we have our target population we have our survey made and hosted and everyone is answering it what do we do with all this data that comes in? That is really the big question. So we have this data access consideration. And what happens is all of the data that's coming in is aggregated. So while you do put in contact information when you answer the questions, that contact information is for our use only to ensure there's no duplicate submissions from organizations. And if we see any errors in the data set, so numbers where there should be letters, letters where there should be numbers, if we need clarifications, if there's a big outlier number that we want to make sure was a correct answer, we need that contact information to be able to check in with you guys. However, when we aggregate the information and we look at the statistical analysis of it, all of that identification and all of that contact information is removed. So throughout our official data reports, none of the identifying contact information will be included. And this is just a reminder to please mute your microphone. So as it's aggregated and reported, we do what we call scrubbing the data. So again, we make sure there's no errors and we do our statistical analysis and we form our official report. Only the Equine Welfare Data Collective has permission to use the raw data set. So the raw data set is the information we pull directly from SurveyMonkey, the big Excel sheet that has all of the contact information in it. So no other organization, no advisory boards, um, no government entities, no one but us gets to see the data numbers associated with the contact information. So any sort of reporting we do has that contact information removed. Once we've done our statistical analysis, we form our official reports and we're getting ready to start working on our first one very shortly. And all of the official reports are released to the general public free of charge. So once our first official report is published online, we will make an announcement and anyone who wants to read it, um, member organizations are what we call our ambassador programs who publicly support us any sort of rescue, sanctuary, general public, your mothers, your grandmothers, your fathers, your trainers, your adopters, they can all see this information within our official report. And again, all of the identifying information is removed and it's only the statistical analysis that is published in our official reports. 
members and we call our data contributors. So if you're an organization who has completed our survey, we consider you a member. Members and ambassadors and ambassadors are overseeing organizations. So a certifying organization, a grant funding organization that shares information about our program to their users. Um, members and ambassadors can request what we call custom, custom reports. So if there's a specific state you would like to see, if there's a specific breed you would like to see a report about, members and ambassadors can request that of us. Again, those customer reports do not include any contact information or any identifying information. For instance, in Wyoming right now, we've only recognized or been able to find information about a very limited number of rescues. So if we were to do a state report specifically for Wyoming, it would be too easy to identify just based on the numbers which rescue is to. So we won't be able to do a state report for Wyoming because it's just too small and too easy to be identifiable. So our goal for any of the reports we make is to make sure it's aggregate and make sure there's no way to identify any single specific organization within it. So data submitters are members. Anyone who submits data can request a copy of their own data back. So say I submitted a survey and I wanna make sure that one, the answers I submitted are correct and two, I wanna just use that information to submit to a grant funder with an application so I don't have to worry about printing out another report. I can request a copy of my own data and we are happy to give it to you. Again, it's all free of charge. We also provide what we call a certificate letter. So if you request a copy of your data and you can currently do that in our survey, our updated survey, if you request a copy of your data, we also give you a certified letter, a PDF, certified PDF, that says you are an active participant, that you're an active participant in our surveys up to our most current survey. And that's a letter that you can share with grant funder applications or certifying applications or anything else like that. Grant funders, certifying agencies, any sort of overseeing agency, some of these are moving to require you to be a participant with the EWDC as part of applications for funding or certifications. And all that means is they either wanna see your certified letter from us, or they may request that you submit your survey answers. So if you request a copy of your data, they might ask for that. The goal and a general complaint has been among the community that organizations are all having their own surveys and that it's become really cumbersome to answer five, 10, you know, however many different applications you're submitting on a yearly basis, they all want their own survey with your own numbers. And because they're moving to just request the EWDC survey, it's gonna start consolidating that. So that means that you only have to do our survey, just our survey, and you can either submit the letter with these organizations because their main goal is just to have the data, the aggregate data to make sure that the entire community has an idea of what's happening, you'll be able to submit just your letter or just your survey. So we have the data, you have your own data, we have the statistical analysis side of it, and we're using a combination of discrete and inferential analysis. And the infer inferential analysis is extremely dependent on the individual questions, the sample size for each individual question. So some questions are gonna require something closer to like a 50% sample size for us to be able to be making any sort of national estimate or regional estimate. And some questions are gonna require as minimum as a 30% sample size of our big general population. So our general population we'll see in our data examples coming up next, our population size is around 900. So 30% of that would be around 300 groups. Our official report does not depend on official sample size. So for our first report, you know, we might not be able to make any national estimates and that's okay, but we can report on the data we do have because we wanna make sure everyone has an idea of kind of where the community is and where the trends within the community are. So onward to our data 
examples. And just so everyone's clear, these data examples that are coming up, they are examples of our current data, but they are just sample purposes only. So these are not any sort of official numbers. We haven't done our official analysis yet, so this is just a really brief picture of the most recent data we have. So our current total population is 918 organizations. So that's 918 municipal organizations, 918 sanctuaries and rescues. And the contributing sample size we have so far, so the number of organizations we have that have worked on the survey is 228. So we're operating around 25, almost 25%. And one question we've gotten is why are we so far only targeting 501c3 and municipal organizations that take custody of animals. We're really specific in that. And our response to that is we have to start somewhere. So there's a lot of people and a lot of questions we could be asking within the community. We could be contacting adopters or breeders or auctions or anyone you can imagine, but it would quickly become extremely overwhelming. So we're starting with this population because this is the one we are most familiar with. And this is, the best place for us to start tracking trends. In the future, we might be creating other surveys and targeting other populations, but just as we start out, this is where we're starting for right now. So these are our state participation rates. And if you look on the left side in the green columns, those are the states themselves. The total organizations is the number of organizations within that state we have identified as taking custody of animals, of equines as either a municipal organization or a 501c3 involved in animal welfare. So for instance, California has an extremely high number of organizations. They are at 107. And then West Virginia and Wyoming have very small numbers. Wyoming only has one organization so far that we've identified. Rhode Island actually as well only has three organizations that we've identified. The percent rate is the percent participation rate. So the percent of organizations within that state that have completed our survey. So 36% of organizations within Maryland have completed our survey. 63% of organizations within Minnesota have completed our survey. And we have several states with a high number like California and what I consider a lower participation rate. So 16, 17%. And we're working hard to reach out to as many organizations as we can directly and encourage them to participate to make sure we get a good picture of each region. So for our regional participation rates, and we're following the federal census regions. So our regional participation rates, we have 25% of region 10. So that includes Washington and Oregon and Idaho and Alaska. We have 16.9% of region nine, and that includes Hawaii and California and Nevada. We have region six with 22.7%, region eight with 31.3%. Region seven is currently the big winner at 34.4%. Region five is 27.1%. Region four is at 20%. Region three is at 33.7%. Region two is 28.8%. And region one is at 26%. And so if you think of it statewide, how there's some states lacking, you'll see that it's important that we be able to evaluate on a national, a regional, and a state basis to really get a picture of where the horses are, where they're coming from, where they're going. And organization categories. So we have 141 of a sample size of 228 organizations, 141 our adoption, rescue, transition centers, however they kind of self-identify. 42 identify solely as sanctuaries. So they don't see themselves as any sort of rescue or transition or adoption center. 41 identify as a combination of groups. So they might see themselves as a sanctuary and adoption center. They might see themselves as a municipal and sanctuary center. Three organizations identify as municipal organizations only. So these are state or city or federally recognized shelters that operate off federal or state or some other municipal funding. So there are organizations out there that don't receive 
most of their funding from municipal organizations. They do receive fun some funding, but they might not identify solely as a municipal organization. So a local nonprofit that might have a contract to help act as animal control might identify as a combination organization. And methods of record keeping, and this is the one that I always find really interesting. So out of 211 responses to this question, 77 responses use Microsoft Excel or some other similar spreadsheet program. 75 responses use paper records, and that's a really high number of organizations that are relying solely on paper records. And then 56 responses are using animal shelter or barn management specific software, and this would be something like Barn Manager, this would be something like Pet Point or Chameleon. And then we had three that have no concrete record keeping. So when I contacted them to ask how they submitted the survey, they said, well, they don't have a lot of animals come in and go each year. So they kind of are just able to keep track mentally of where their animals are coming from, how long they've been there as it goes. It'd be nice um, for estimates and in terms of data set if we can do our best to get everyone using at least paper records. My favorite part about this question is that we have been able to identify a big need for some sort of easy to access computer tracking system. So even the people who use some sort of animal shelter or barn management system they ask and hope that we might be able to come up with some sort of solution because the animal shelter or barn management specific software isn't an end all be all that some of them are using multiple different softwares on top of paper records because they don't feel any one specific software can really do all the things we need. So there's definitely a clear and specific need for that. And then the big data question and answer is the intakes and outcomes. So again, this is just an example. We have 198 responses for this question so far. And it starts with the number of equines within your organization's care on January 1st, 2018. And this is for the first half of 2018. Again, we're asking our surveys updated every six months. And we ask in chunks of six months because for the majority of groups, that's the least difficult way to do it, the least cumbersome way to do it. So as of January 1st, 2018, with nearly 200 groups responding, we had 9,824 total equines in custody. This includes donkeys and mules and draft horses and ponies. If it's shaped like a horse, it's in custody. There's 9,824. 155 total intakes were stray or at large, loose, running around. 1,640 were relinquished directly by owners. That's 40% of all our reported intakes were relinquished directly by owners. 278 were adoption returns. So these are animals that were previously adopted out and were returned within, and this goes organization to organization, usually within 30 days of the initial contract. 669, so 16% were law enforcement confiscations. 464 were transferred in from another agency. 216 were purchased at public auction. 348 were purchased directly from a kill pen or kill buyer. 88 were born in the shelter. And 182 were from other intakes. So that means for the first half of 2018, there was a total reported 4,040 intakes. For outcomes, 3,643 animals were adopted out. So that's over an 80% adoption rate among these 200 organizations, which is really impressive. 62 were returned to the owner. 163 were transferred to another agency. 431 were euthanized. And we didn't ask the region reason for euthanasia. Um, on our new Updated survey, we do ask if the organization provides a community euthanasia program, and that's to help us identify where their euthanasia is. We just want to have that caveat because it could be that a high percentage of those euthanasias are directly from a community euthanasia service. So it is not reflected on anything the organization is doing. It's just a stat uh, statistic for us to know and see if it might relate to the number of organizations offering that community service. 
102 died in care, and then 82 were other outcomes. And some of those other outcomes included being adopted directly into the organization itself that might be running a therapeutic program. So some of the rescues out there are also running therapeutic programs. So they considered that another outcome that if the animal stayed in their facility, but was transferred essentially to ownership of that facility for therapeutic riding reasons. The total outcomes listed were 4,483. So that combined with the total intakes and the animals already in care means that as of June 30th, 2018, within these 200 organizations, there were 9,381 animals in custody on June 30th. So that is the major points of our presentation today. And I hope that you've learned a little bit about the program and that it sets you up to be thinking about our open Q&A. This has been a recording of a live webinar presentation. For brevity, we have cut out the live question and answer portion that followed the end of the webinar. We're happy to answer any questions you have via phone or email. You're always welcome to email the Equine Welfare Data Collective at ewdc at horsecouncil.org. Thank you again for listening.